Hello out there and welcome to another episode of Happy Reading. Today I am so excited to read to you from one of my favorite books from this last year. It's called All You Need Is Love. Oh, you see? Need with a K-N. It's a pun. You gotta love that. And it's about food. Puns and food, people. It doesn't get better than that. Um, this is about Alba, a 12-year-old girl who lives in New York with her mom and dad. And her father, unfortunately, is physically and emotionally abusive towards her mother. And she kind of witnesses this happen to her mom and, and feels powerless, doesn't really know what to do about it. And her mom finally decides that she needs to send Alba away because she shouldn't see this relationship. It's not healthy. And so she sends Alba to Barcelona, Spain to spend time with her grandmother, whom she has not seen in a very, very long time. And she's not excited about this trip. She doesn't know what to expect. When she gets there, she you know, is on the defense, her walls are up. And then on her second night there or her second day there, um, she ends up going to a bakery to pick up some bread and starts talking to the man who owns the bakery, who actually has a connection to her mother and her family. And over time they bond and Alba starts learning how to bake bread um, and really becomes passionate about baking and being at the bakery she makes um, some new friends and explores the city. And it's just an, an incredible book. It made me want to go back to Barcelona. I went last year and I loved it. Um, and it made me want to eat lots of bread, which you know is not a bad thing. So hopefully you will enjoy it as much as I did. It was written by Tanya Guerrero. And I'm going to read you chapter seven. I could have read any chapter, honestly. They're all fabulous. Um, but this is her first full day in Barcelona, I do believe. Here we go. The next morning, after tossing and turning through the night, I woke up with knots in my stomach. A new day. A second chance not to screw everything up all over again. I would get out of bed, have breakfast, and then maybe something amazing would happen. Something life-changing. Think positive, Alba. But... It was hard, you know? Thinking positive didn't come naturally to me. Gloom and doom was more my thing. It hurt less that way. If you expected bad stuff to happen all the time, then life was liable to be less disappointing, right? Right. Finally, I shuffled into the kitchen in my pajamas. The knots in my stomach had multiplied. It felt like my intestines had tangled around the rest of my organs. Good morning, I said, trying my best to sound cheery. Abuela Lola was at the stove, eyeing one of those stovetop coffee makers. She glanced at me and smiled. Buenos dias. You're up early. Yeah, well, I didn't sleep much. Ah, jet lag. You'll feel better in a couple of days. Abuela Lola gestured at the kitchen table with her chin. Sit. I'll fix you up some coffee. It'll help. Coffee? I watched her pour a generous amount of steaming milk from a small pot into a mug and then top it off with some freshly brewed coffee. She placed it on the table in front of me, and then she poured herself a cup before sitting. I reached for the sugar container and dumped a heaping teaspoon into my mug, all the while eyeing Abuela Lola from across the table. She was wearing a tunic-type dress that was casual yet sophisticated. Her hair was pulled back in a single braid, and her face was devoid of makeup but fresh-looking, as if she'd already cleansed and moisturized it. And she thought I was up early? Jeez. Abuela Lola must be one of those old ladies who are up at the crack of dawn. So after breakfast, I have an errand for you to run, she said casually. An errand? She raised her eyebrows. Don't act surprised, Alba. You're almost 13. I think I can trust you to walk a couple of blocks to buy some bread. Besides, it will be good for you to explore the neighborhood a bit. You need to start brushing up on your Spanish. I gulped air. Little did she know how horrible my Spanish was. Atrocious virtually non-existent. Okay, bread. Yeah, I guess I can do that. Good, she said with a nod. El Rincón del Pan is four blocks to the right on the corner. You can't miss it. And ask for Tony, the owner. He's an old friend of the family, so he knows what I like. Great. Buying bread was easy enough, but schmoozing with some dude, a supposed family friend, was going to be more challenging. It wasn't much of a schmoozer, and besides, I wasn't all that ready to meet people. I mean, it still felt like my head was in New York City, one foot on the plane and the other in Barcelona. I was all over the place. Hump, groan, sigh. 
The street was quiet and chaotic at the same time. It sounds weird, but that's how it was. There were no cars or buses or motorcycles, yet there was traffic. Throngs of people meandered from one alley to the other, holding shopping bags. Bicycles swerved among the crowds, avoiding the sidewalk cafes and trees and benches and blocks of pigeons eating scattered breadcrumbs from the ground. Voices echoed, bouncing off the narrow corridors, interrupted only by the occasional church bell and guitarist playing on the sidewalk. I was transfixed. I stood in front of Abuela Lola's apartment with my mouth hanging open. You'd think that having grown up in New York City, I would have seen it all, but this was different. Okay, El Rincón del Pan, four blocks to the right on the corner. You can't miss it. I started walking, trying my best to blend in. Back home, I was the expert at blending in. It was easy, but Barcelona was new to me. Going down its streets felt like I was playing a brand new video game. I had no idea where to go, what was up ahead, what I was doing, what would happen to me. El Rincón del Pan. El Rincón del Pan. El Rincón del Pan. Apparently, it meant the corner of bread or the bread corner or something like that. I kept on repeating it in case I forgot. Four blocks shouldn't have taken me that long, but there was so much to see. Street performers, artists drawing chalk masterpieces on the concrete, little shops with all sorts of unusual trinkets. I halted in front of a store window where something caught my attention, rows and rows of silk scarves. My eyes hopscotched from the bright orange one with purple stripes to the emerald green one with pink diamonds to the tie-dyed one in various shades of blue. Those were the ones I knew mom would like. The more I stared at them, the more my throat hurt because those silk scarves were the kind that mom used to cover up her bruises, bruises that my father gave her. Sometimes they were subtle, a couple of purplish green spots near her collarbone. Sometimes they were more obvious, finger marks around her neck. And sometimes they were so bad, even the scarves couldn't cover them up. On those days, only a turtleneck would do. I spun around, all those thoughts, all those emotions, maybe I could blow them out of my body. That's when I saw it on the corner, El Rincón del Pan. It was a teensy bread bakery in a strange looking building. The structure was only three stories high, but the design was straight out of a Dr. Seuss book, curved and curly and wavy with hardly any straight edges. Around the windows were concrete petals with wrought iron leaves and stems. The bakery itself had a worn wooden front, arched doors, and a stained glass window above the sign. I approached it, eyeing the display of breads, which were arranged in baskets, on trays and on platters, with bouquets of herbs and dried flowers in between. Even from several feet away, I could smell the yeasty aroma. At the door, I placed my hand on the knob and pushed. Ding, ding, ding. There was a tiny brass bell above me. Hola, nena. Que tal? said a man by the display case. I stiffened, pretending to browse the breads and pastries to buy myself some time. The entire walk there, all I'd memorized was the name of the place. I hadn't even considered what I was going to say in Spanish. Um, quiero, uh, bread? I mean, pan? To eat? I blurted out. That's when the man's gaze found mine. His eyes were sparkly blue and familiar. Oh, hello again, he said. It was him, the man from the back alley with the apron and the weird footwear. My cheeks were blazing hot all of a sudden. Um, hi. Ugh. Why, of all the people in the entire world? You are American, he asked, raising his eyebrows if he was confused or something. I stepped back a tiny bit and squinted at him. Why? Nothing, really. It's just that last night I assumed you were a runaway. It's not the first time someone has turned up at the back. In this neighborhood, there are always people in need of a good sandwich and some kindness, he said with a smile. At first, I didn't reply. I studied him from head to toe. In the dark, he looked older, more worn out, but under the bright lights of the bakery and with a clean apron on, he seemed more youthful, even with his graying hair and beard. His Spanish accent was pretty thick, but his English was good. Great, actually. Is this guy for real? You speak English, I asked, stating the obvious. I apprenticed in New York and San Francisco. That's where I learned to bake and to speak English. He reached for some baguettes from a nearby baking sheet and then stuck them into a tall basket before wiping his hands on his apron. What can I help you with? I glanced at the wooden shelves and counters, 
and the baskets of round breads, oval breads, long breads, square breads, and buns and croissants and other sweet sticky type breads. I had no idea what I was supposed to buy. My grandma, Magdalena, um, she told me to come here to get some bread. Magda? You are Magda's granddaughter? Of course, she told me last week. So Isabel is your mother. Fantastic. He took my hand as if to bring me closer. I pulled away. That's when I spotted the name tag on his shirt. Tony. Oh, so you're Tony. My grandma mentioned you. The man stepped back, but his smile stayed put. Yes, that's me. Isabel, your mother, was my childhood friend. My best friend. Best friend? How come I've never heard of him before? I stared at his salt and pepper hair and beard, at his eyes, blue as the sky on a clear summer day. This man, this place, Abuela Lola, the scarves, all those scarves in the window display reminding me of mom. Suddenly, I was overwhelmed again. My knees, my stomach, my heart went weak. I wobbled. Ding, ding, ding. A customer walked in, an old lady with a cane. Her penciled in eyebrows arched when she saw me. Tony put his arm around my shoulders, and then he spoke to a woman by the register, who I guessed was the cashier. Estelle, voy un ratito a la trastienda. Estelle glanced at me and nodded. Tony guided me to the back of the shop, through a swinging door down a short corridor. We entered a spacious room. I just stood there, taking it all in. There was plenty of sunlight streaming through the windows, illuminating the stainless steel counters, ovens, mixers, racks, bowls piled on top of one another, all sorts of whisks and spatulas and jars, jars everywhere, filled with different colored liquids and pastes. Up above were hanging bundles of dried herbs and flowers, as if a garden was growing from the ceiling. Sit. Tony pulled out some stools. I plopped onto one of them. Slowly, very slowly, the numbness began to leave my body. I watched him turn an electric kettle on, and then he arranged a glass teapot and two cups on the table. He snipped a handful of white flowers from a nearby upside down bouquet, dropped them into the teapot, and poured the boiling water over them. Within a few seconds, the water turned golden yellow. Manzanilla tea. You probably know it as chamomile. It's good for relaxing the nerves, he said, pouring some into both cups. I took a sip. The tea was almost too hot, but the temperature of it jolted me. Its taste made me feel like I was standing in a field of flowers on a hot summer day. Thank you for this and for the sandwich last night and for, I don't know, for being nice to me. My voice came out sounding somewhere between a whisper and a croak. De nada, don't even mention it. He stuck his hand out. Why don't we give ourselves a fresh start, huh? I'm Antony, but my best friends and family call me Tony. I shook his hand. Alba, it's wonderful to meet you, Alba. I took another sip, sneaking peeks at all the unusual things around us. It was sort of like a weird mashup of a bakery and a mad scientist laboratory. The glass jars were particularly interesting. Inside them, the colored liquids fizzed and bubbled, and there were blobby, leafy objects floating on the surface. What's in all those jars, I finally asked. Tony hopped off his stool with a gleam in his eye. These are my yeast water and sourdough children. It's what I use to leaven bread instead of commercial yeast. It's how people used to bake bread in the Middle Ages. He grabbed a couple of jars and put them in front of me. In these jars, I've got dried fig and rosemary, fresh cherry, and tomato basil yeast waters. And in this one, I've got a basic flour and water sourdough starter, which makes the most amazing tasting crumb. I frowned. He might as well have been speaking Japanese or Swedish or some other language I couldn't understand. I don't get it. How does that stuff end up as bread? Tony unscrewed the jars. Go on, take a whiff. I bent over and smelled each jar. Some smelled fruity, or some smelled like fruity, fizzy beer, and others were more subtly sour, like banana mixed with yogurt. There's naturally existing wild yeast in everything organic. By mixing different fruits, vegetables, herbs, and even flour with water and sometimes sugar, you can harness the wild yeast through the fermentation process. Once that's done, then you can mix in different kinds of flours, more water and salt to make bread. Tony set the jars aside, and then he brought out a large stainless steel bowl with a kitchen towel over it. He took the towel off and pointed at the white goop inside. This dough has been fermenting for approximately eight hours. You see those bubbles? Those make all the holes in the bread when you slice it open, he said excitedly. Wow, it sounded stupid, but I couldn't find anything better to say. 
to me, bread was just bread. I'd never considered that there was an entire science or art that went into making it. But Tony seemed much more than just an ordinary everyday kind of baker. He was like a bread baker and scientist and artist rolled into one. It was overwhelming, but it also amazed me that someone could dedicate his entire life to making something as simple as bread. Anyway, I won't bore you with any more, said Tony with a chuckle. He took a baguette and a round loaf from a nearby tray and slid them into paper bags. Tell that grandmother of yours that these are on the house. I insist. I took the bags. This smells good, I said with a smile. Well, I hope you think it tastes good too. If you want, come back some other time. The shop closes in the afternoons for lunch and siesta, but I usually spend those hours experimenting back here. He gave me this look. I'd seen a look like that before. One day when I was in Central Park, there was a little kid and her dad getting ice cream cones from the Mr. Softy truck. As soon as the kid got her cone, she jumped up and down. In all her excitement, she loosened her grip and the cone dropped to the ground, splattering vanilla ice cream and rainbow sprinkles by her feet. She was about to burst into tears, but then her dad bent down and gave her this look of tenderness before handing her his own cone. For whatever reason, that memory had stuck in my head as if it was permanently attached with crazy glue. Maybe it was because I wasn't used to people looking at me that way, with tenderness and generosity. My throat tightened, but I managed to say, okay. Let's go through the VIP exit, Tony said, leading me to a scratched up metal door. It squeaked open and I caught sight of the back alley and the dumpster from last night. I look forward to seeing more of you, Alba. I nodded. Goodbye. Tony closed the door. For a moment, I didn't move. I thought about his kind eyes. I thought about the delicious sandwich he'd given me even though I was a total stranger. I thought about his bread and how amazing it smelled. I thought about all the weird and wonderful stuff he told me. Most of it didn't make any sense. But even then, for a couple of minutes, I found myself forgetting about mom and dad and why they'd sent me away. Forgetting about all my problems, all that mumbo jumbo about wild yeast and bubbles and dough distracted me somehow. I brought the bags of bread up to my nose and sniffed. That smell, there was something about that smell. All right, all you need is love. If you wanna find out what happens to Alba while she is in Barcelona and what happens with her family and the bakery, then you're gonna to have to read this incredible book. I hope you go out and find it at your local library or your school library or your independent bookseller. All right, until next time, as you go out in the world, make sure that you are kind, that you have fun and that you read a whole heck of a lot. Until next time. Bye. Happy reading.